Then Black, would you ask a good Lord to look after us while we do this, please? Dear Lord, to forgive us of our sins, both sins, and forgive us the sins of omission. And guide us and direct us as we go into the coming days of this service. We pray all this by your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> we uh we have two or three different things we need to do. Uh first I want to recognize all the uh Agri leaders, Representative James, since you were a charter member of Agri leader, do you want to say a little dab about how good Agri leaders is and couldn't help you a whole lot? But go ahead. <laughs> Bash your button down there. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being so kind. <laughs> and my friends or my colleagues in the leadership course staff, I get beat up on all the time by Tom McCall. But let me tell you, the course that you're in now will prepare you to accept these kinds of things and smile and keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was a member of the charter class, and it's one of the best decisions I ever made to become a part of that class because it helped me in a lot of ways uh, that uh, I would not have been helped had I not been a part of it. Now, Jimmy Hill, <clears throat> I hate to say this in his presence now, he have a beautiful wife, and I think he married up, but he is mean to you. <laughs> but there were some times when uh, when I joined, I was an old man when I joined. As a matter of fact, I think they kind of changed the rules just a little bit there, and they accepted people a little bit older, because I think 50 was a cutoff, and I was a day or two over 50. And I had back problems, but the kindest people were in my class to help me to get the things done that I needed to do. So I want to tell you that I commend you for becoming a part of it, and as you grow in life, you'll find that you have never done anything, made a wiser choice in your life than becoming a part of the Agro Leader. It's a wonderful class. Jimmy Hill, we thank you for being a part of it and sticking with it so long. And I just applaud you all for what you do, or what you're going to do, rather, and good to see you up here today. And if we can help you, please call on us. Thank you, Lynn Moore. Since this is a... 25th year for the Agri leaders, and you were in the charter class, and you were 52 when you when you joined. <laughs> Jimmy, we appreciate you being able to bring your crowd here, and we appreciate them coming, and hope y'all learn a little something through the whole program. Uh, but today, we hope you learn a little bit about how your state government works, and uh, you're gonna hear two or three things in here that. Uh, may pique your interest a little bit. And I would encourage all of y'all that I don't want you running against any of us, but if we retire <laughs> or get voted out by some other means, y'all think about doing this because y'all the kind of folks we want looking after Georgia and especially rural Georgia. Uh, to all you out to the committee members of the joint, you know, they, the Egg Association and the Agribusiness Council does an omelet breakfast for us every year. That's Thursday morning at 7.30. Uh, Jim Collins, I, I'd rather go to this and some of the stuff we're probably going to have to do, but it's the 50th year anniversary for the Tifton Bulls test sale. He's giving all of us tomorrow an invitation, but he wanted me to announce that to you today. Uh... I don't know about y'all, but I've gotten two or three emails on House Bill 1060. It's that gas chamber bill. I've got them from California, Florida, Germany, Connecticut, Holland, Pennsylvania, Louisiana, Texas. And and, and I'm not even halfway through how many i got. So uh, I said that for two reasons. One is folks all over the world evidently interested in this thing. The other reason I said it, I actually do look at that stuff to see where they're from anyhow. Uh, but we're waiting on a fiscal note on it. It's going to be a little more expensive to the state and to the counties. Uh, 
there's a last paragraph in that thing that, that allows anybody to file a lawsuit that wants to uh, against a shelter if they don't do certain things. That gives me a little bit of heartburn. So we're waiting on a fiscal note from for 1060 if any of your constituents get on you and want to know what the problem is is why we're not moving it. That's why we, that's what we're waiting on. Uh, some of the stuff described and it's going to cost a good bit more. Uh, why we got a quorum? Uh, there's two bills we need to vote out. Uh, Representative Smith, would you give us the House Bill 649? Yes, sir. Whatever you want to do. That's fine with Tom. Thank you. Mash your button, Tom, and let me see which one we're on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. I come before you with House Bill 649 by substitute. And um, we um, have with us today, uh, uh, which they're not asking the speaker anything, they just uh, want to, I just wanted to acknowledge their presence. Uh, the Georgia Blueberry Growers Association is, is represented here. And uh, also we have the Farm Bureau represented and uh, Bob and uh, Tommy Irwin's represented by uh, Bobby Harris. Everybody's in agreement on the bill, and uh, it sets up a commodity commission for blueberries. As you all know, we have a number of commodity commissions around the state, uh, and they help to promote our agricultural products. We have been working uh, with the chairman now for about f three or four years, uh, and he's been, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your patience in working with us. We had to get everybody in agreement uh, throughout the state, and we finally done that in this package, and uh, that's why I mentioned those earlier that uh, are here uh, in uh, uh, support of the legislation. There is one amendment to the uh, bill before you that uh, we've all agreed on that uh, with an oversight that we noticed last night, and uh, it's down on uh, page 3, line uh, 30. Three, uh, where it says such members shall be selected so that one member is from the northern part of Georgia and one is from the southern part and it goes on to uh, um, delineate what all that is. Um, this, this would be a problem because we don't have that many uh, blueberry growers, uh, active growers outside of uh, the southern part of the state. So we're asking that uh, language uh, from on line 33 beginning and let, I'll, I'll ask this legislative council here if you'll make sure I'm saying this right that on uh, line 33 beginning with such members that be struck all the way down to line 4 on uh, page 4 where it says the southern part Strike all that language and insert in lieu of it uh, shall be an active blueberry grower. Representative Smith, you know, we talked this morning. I, I ain't smart enough to know law your language, but the uh, legal counsel says that if we do that, it will scratch it on every cot commodity commission already in existence. Oh, is that right? So I guess we need to leave that in there and come up with somebody from above McDuffie County. <laughs> I, okay, didn't know, well, I didn't know that this morning and Wayne okay, just told me it, that uh, it would do what Wayne? If I may hit your button Wayne. The language that's in here that you see is existing language which applies to all other agriculture cultural commodity commissions with the exception of cotton and peanuts. So if you make these changes here, you're doing it for every other ag commodity commission. Mr. Chairman, may I ask him a question? Oh, yeah. Uh, is there any way to, to do it and restrict it just to blueberries? Would you go over the changes again that you're suggesting? Sir? Would you go over the changes again that you're suggesting? Could you, re could you repeat? The amendment. Could, could, you, could, you, could you do what we're trying to do and just limit it to the blueberry commodity commission? If you I, hang on just a second. 
that Kevin may have a solution. Yeah, what I would uh, respectfully suggest, if it's okay with council, is just to put at the end of that, uh, the instead of striking the language, just put at the end of that paragraph, a per, you know, we lawyers love the provided however, but provided however that um, the Blueberry Commission shall consist of, you know, member just from the, the southern part of Georgia. I mean, I, you know, obviously have to legalize it up. And, and I apologize, uh, Representative Smith, could you point out again to me the, the exact provisions that you were concerned with? The exact language? The, yes, point out to me in the bill. Yeah, uh, I would just, my, I think what he's saying would work, and my suggestion was to just add the word shall be an active blueberry grower. Where are you on the bill, on the substitute? Page three. Uh, on page uh, three, line 33. down to page four, line, line four, where it ends up saying southern part. Okay, if you could bear with me just a second, I'll. Okay, give me just a second. Mr. Chairman, while we're pausing here, I neglected to give the names of our uh, folks from Alma, Steve Mullis, David Lee, and Jay Cornelius. And then Taz Smith uh, is with Farm View, and I rec recognized, I think, uh, Bobby Harris a while ago, but they drove a long way up here, and I just wanted the folks to know their names. <laughs> Appreciate y'all coming. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. If you're ready, I think I have some yeah, language. At the end of line 34, to accomplish what Representative Smith would like to do, uh, I suggest for the committee inserting before the period semicolon provided comma, however comma, that such geographical requirements shall not apply to members of the Agricultural Commodity Commission for blueberries. Okay, we go. And let me ask you one other thing. Would it be a problem to add, uh, but shall be an active blueberry grower? I think that's required elsewhere that, that okay. they need to be a right. producer in the bill. Okay. Is that okay, Representative Smith? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You got anything else? That's it. Wayne, would you read that one more time? Tell us where you are. Yes, sir. On, on page three at the end of line 34, just before the period, insert the, insert the words semicolon, provided comma, however comma, that such geographical requirements shall not apply to members of the Agricultural Commodity Commission for Blueberries. All right, thank you. Who's 26? You started off, I was going to make a fast suggestion, but that sharp legal mind of uh, Representative Levitas just beat me to the punch. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Levitas, that's, that's really just my background as a farmer in North DeKalb County is really what it is. <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, my only question, I have a question for counsel. Is the, is, the, is the part about being an active grower, is that in existing code section? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, uh, you got a constituent that would meet these requirements? That's right. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. We're glad. All right. Does everybody understand where we are? Need a motion. Move to pass. As amended. As amended. Second. Is that second? All in favor say aye. Aye. Poll no. Representative Smith, you can go home and rest for <coughs> the first time in four years. <laughs> well, we got a few, a few other fish to fry today, haven't we? All right, the other bill we need to vote on is Senate Bill 418. In a nutshell, what this is, it is um, uh, what this is in a nutshell basically is and I can't make this thing quit. There you go. All right. It's an agreement between the firefighters and the uh, cigarette companies uh, 
uh, basically in, in national and state agreements, and they've already signed model legislation that uh, uh, requires all cigarettes to be sold, and this one is just for Georgia, to be the no-burn kind. If you're not puffing on it, it goes out. Uh, firefighters want it, uh, and I, I think there's some in the audience uh, that, that if you have any questions, I'd be glad to get them to tell you their feelings on it, and if they want to anyway, that's okay. Uh, but what it does is basically if uh, it's a wrapping on a, a round of tobacco, tobacco's not changing, uh, that if you're not puffing on it within 15 millimeters, which is about five-eighths of an inch from the end, the thing will go out. It's, uh, it's a lot of language in the bill. The, uh, the stores will be able to sell their existing inventory till July 2020. Um, it's, it comes under some of the regulations come under the Fire and Insurance Commissioner. Uh, but basically, if there's a cigarette sold after July the 1st, 2010 in Georgia, it has to be one of these no-burn kind. And I'm just going to tell you a personal reason I like it is one of my biggest hay barns is right on the edge of the road. And last year during that drought, I took a doji and dug a fire break around it just in case some idiot came down the road and flipped a cigarette out and I wouldn't have four or five hundred rolls of hay going up in smoke. So I like the bill for that reason. The firefighters like it because some guy going to sleep with a cigarette burning in his bed ain't going to burn the house down. But convenience stores okay with it. Matter of fact, Jim Tudor came over here a while ago to personally tell me that, that he was okay. Uh, the big cigarette companies are okay with it, and it's not really going to negatively affect anything. The price not going to go up. Uh, if a guy buys a carton of cigarettes in South Carolina, Alabama, Tennessee, if one of those states are not under this no-burn uh, regulation, then you know he ain't going to get arrested if he brings it back to Georgia and smokes it. He just can't buy any in Georgia that are not the no-burn kind. Uh, if any of uh, y'all have any questions, uh, I'll try to answer them. If they hard questions, I'm going to refer them to the firefighters or Don Cargill. So other than that, I'll try to answer a question or two if it's not lawyer language. But uh, Thank you. see you get two lawyers talking. That's fine. I'm glad you answered this question because I couldn't. That's right. He uh, he does he uh, he doesn't want to mess up his tobacco patch next to his blueberry bushes there. That's <laughs> does anybody have any questions? All right, there. To uh, I guess. Mr. Chairman, since you don't want to handle the lawyer language, let me let me ask counsel. Wayne, on page five, uh, line eight and nine, and then again on page six, lines twenty-eight through thirty-two, we're referring to something from New York State. Are we are we um, abdicating? General Assembly control or our abilities to another state. Representative Engel, I, I, my opinion, I do think that does present some delegation of power issues, constitutional issues. Uh, if you look at those provisions, in essence, it allows the state of New York to control what Georgia does. Thank There's you. 21 other states that have passed this right. that with similar language to that, and I think the agreed upon deal with the firefighters and cigarette companies. New York was the uh, model language, I think, is the way it was, and that's why that's in there. But Wayne is right. Would there be a way to adopt? adopt that standard but say basically that we adopted as of this date 
and then if we need to go in and make changes subsequent to this then we could go in and, and make whatever adjustments need to be made so, I mean I don't have a problem with using their standards since obviously it is it's something that everybody agrees to but uh, what we are doing is allowing another state to make decisions or change law uh, that that will affect Georgians and I guess that's that's my concern and if we could say effective at the fire, New York fire safety standards as of July 1 of 2008 if those standards are, have been implemented already in New York or already in effect that would solve the problem if you adopt them as of a date certain and then the General Assembly in its wishes if it needs to come back later and update that date that would solve the issue okay and I guess my question then would be Don and, and y'all would that be okay go ahead Don Mission standard for California, and and so what what we're trying to do is set a uniform standard all over the United States, where the where the various cigarette companies will not have to reproduce a cigarette for each different state. Uh, okay. to that, and, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and I have discussed this with Lane uh, at length. We discussed it with Sewell. Uh, our attorneys uh, uh, for the company and for the industry feel like that that we. Uh, since the other states have done this, you're not really abdicating your thing. Uh, uh, Wayne and, and uh, Sewell very correctly have said that if this is challenged in law, that we would lose that and uh, in that particular section. And uh, but it is by uh, we've done with this by precedent before uh, in several other uh, instances. <coughs> To, to possibly solve the portion of losing the lawsuit, and if we added the date certain in it, that would solve that. Well, we, we would certainly and have to bend to, to legislative council uh, here in the state. I, I just don't want us to get into this and then somebody come along and throw the whole thing out because we've done something they, that, that they would be would unconstitutional. Throw the whole thing out. That, that particular part would be, be thrown out if that was ever challenged. Okay. But it has not been challenged in the 26 other states that it, you've got the exact same language. It's, uh, it's in this bill. Okay. Thank you. 25. My question has been asked, Mr. Chairman. Okay. The uh, farmer from DeKalb. I'll wait, Mr. Chairman. I'll wait. you wait? Wave. Oh, wave. Okay. I thought you was coming up. I thought you was scheming up something else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's the committee's pleasure? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Oh, no. All right, thank you all. Now, we got a couple of uh, couple little deals. Dean Angle, how, where, how long y'all going to take? Okay. Go ahead and do your show, because this other one's going to take a little while. Y'all, we, uh, we have Dean Angle, Dean of the College of Agriculture at the University of Georgia, and uh, some of his crew to uh, update us on what's going on with ag in the state, and we appreciate you coming. <laughs> Probably the best administrative group anywhere in the country that is leading a college of agriculture. I'm going to take just 10 minutes to update you on where the college is and how some of the, the funding issues that you have worked on in the past have uh, played into the direction of the college. Uh, first, I would like to say uh, to the committee as well as to the audience that the, uh, the agriculture industry in Georgia is growing. It's not by an accident that this is happening. It, it's not easy to be a farmer these days, as many of you know. Uh, commodity prices, while they're good, your input costs are also very high, and it's, it's a tough business right now. But Georgia agriculture, it's growing, and it's growing because 
of many of you in here. It's taken a, a team effort with the, your committee and the Senate committee, uh, certainly the governor's office, the College of Agriculture, the, the Farm Bureau, the Agribusiness Council, uh, and many, many other groups that have all worked collectively to assure that this industry continues to grow. It's about a $12 billion industry at the farm gate value uh, currently, and by that time that food gets to your plate and the fiber is on your back and some of the wood has been used to construct your house, it's almost a $53 billion industry, so it's by far the biggest industry in the state. And so I want to thank you for uh, taking your, your job seriously in promoting the, the largest industry in the state of Georgia. So a very brief update on where we are and where we're going. Uh, we're probably ranked number four nationally as a college of agriculture, but our goal is to be number one, the top college of ag in the country. And I don't think it's an unattainable goal. It's certainly a, a stretch, but something we can get to. The, uh, you know, why is it important for us to have a good college of agriculture in the state of Georgia? Uh, it's not because uh, rankings, unless you're in football, really make much difference. Uh, rather, it's because when you're a top-ranked college, you keep and you invite into your state the best academic talent anywhere in the world. And so our job is to keep the best researchers, the best scientists, the best educators, the best extension agents in Georgia and to attract the best from around the country. Uh, including with that, I'd, I'd also add students and staff. And, and so as our ability to meet the needs of Georgia and to promote our abilities around the world, we're bringing better and better people into this state, uh, which is a, a negative brain drain. So we are, we're bringing the best and the brightest from around the world to Georgia because they want to come work in the College of Agriculture, and they're the ones who will, who will um, promote new technologies into the future and continue to allow agriculture to grow in the way it has been. Uh, as all of you know, it's a huge college. It is one of the biggest in the country. Uh, we are, we've got office, extension offices in all but, two off, uh, all but two counties of the state, and one of those we're working on for a new office. This map shows you where we are located. We've got research farms uh, throughout the state as well as, uh, as well as three campuses in Athens and Tifton and Griffin. I want to touch upon a couple of those later on. But I want to talk about both the experiment station, the extension service, and teaching separately on our agricultural experiment station, which Dr. Schulstead is now leading. Uh, one of the things that is so unique to agriculture is there is not a uh, R&D shop for agriculture. There is no one go-to place. IBM, Coca-Cola, Boeing all have an R&D shop, so they do in-house research, they have in-house educational programs, and they have a mechanism to get that new research out to the people who need it in their company. Agriculture doesn't have that. We're a very dispersed uh, we're dispersed and diverse, and because of that, a one-stop shop would not work in this business. And so the Agricultural Experiment Station has become the research and development shop for states around the country. And just a good example of this, and got some tomatoes up here. Uh, one of our South Gro Georgia uh, growers just last week asked, how could we go about turning some of their vegetable processing waste or rotted vegetables into ethanol for energy production on the farm? Uh, there is nowhere in the country you can go to to get this work done other than the Agricultural Experiment Station. And so we are designing a project. We'll be seeking some federal funding, working with this farmer to do this. But again, there is nowhere else in the country that this type of work can be done. It's a critically important issue if you're a vegetable grower in South Georgia, and it's up to us to help that individual as well as the entire industry come up with a solution. Um, I, I did insert this in here just again to remind you of who our top leadership is in the College of Agriculture, and I have this in here because we have two new people in the college, Dr. Joe West, who is on the right-hand side there. He is our Director of Programs at Tifton. Uh, he replaced David Bridges, who, as you all know, is, is now the President of ABAC, and then Dr. Jerry Arkin, who is our Griffin Program Leader, as he is on the left there. Uh, but it is a powerful team in research. A uh, number of hot topics right now, um, and, and you know as much about these as we do, bioenergy, water, food safety, land use, sustainable agriculture. These are all things that we are asked about on a daily basis and have built teams of people who can address each of these issues. On the extension side, our extension program in Georgia is probably second to none. We have got, uh, while we don't rank extension programs nationally, it's got to be one of the very best, uh, number one, number two, number three in the country. And our 4-H program, which a lot of you have been involved with and have been great supporters of in the past, 
is the top 4-H program in the country. 4-H uh, is viewed as the leading youth development program anywhere in the world, and Georgia is fortunate enough to have the top 4-H program in this country. So we've got the best facilities, the best programs, the best people, the best leadership in this group, and it's really a, it's really a privilege to be in a state, from my perspective, to work with such fabulous people. Uh, a lot of hot topics and extension as well. Again, water, we have a, a water team that is intimately involved in helping us deal with the drought, labor issues, both internal and external, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, health and wellness, and one that I diffly, diffly, did leave off here was um, uh, youth preparation. Uh, this is a good state and has a bright future. It's because of 4-H, in my opinion, FFA, and a few other leadership groups that are preparing, preparing young people today for uh, taking over for you uh, 20 years, 30 years from now. On the teaching side, uh, we're very proud of our teaching uh, undergraduate student numbers. We're up to about 1,450 students. This is a 30 percent increase in just a couple years. As many of you know, one of our biggest challenges in the College of Agriculture is to be, has been to get people students into the college, in particular rural students who come from uh, public high schools where maybe uh, there was inadequate preparation from advanced placement classes, honors classes, SAT prep. So the, the rural kids who wanted to study agriculture were having trouble getting into the College of Agriculture. We've been able to turn that around in the last couple of years, not at the freshman level, but rather at the transfer level, where now if you want to transfer in into the College of Agriculture or to the College of Forestry, uh, we have a significant influence on whether or not those students will get in. And frankly, for the last couple of years, most of the students who wanted to transfer into the College of Ag were able to get in. And so that's really what is primarily responsible for increased uh, student numbers. We still have a ways to go. Uh, many of our peer institutions have many more students than we do, and we believe that that number will continue to grow. One of the interesting things about the college is that we are now majority female for the first time. Uh, ever, we have more female students in the undergraduate ranks of our college. Diversity in the college is increasing, uh, both in terms of um, African American students as well as Hispanic students. Now, the numbers are still low, and we don't believe we are anywhere near where we need to be, but at least we're going in the right direction, and we have rededicated ourselves to trying to increase the diversity of the College of Agriculture. And the last thing is I want you to know is that the College of Ag students uh, rank above the average student at the University of Georgia. Uh, we're very proud of our students at Georgia. We've got very high standards, uh, as all of you know, high SATs, high incoming uh, uh, high school senior uh, student GPAs, uh, but our students actually rank above the average student at the University of Georgia. So these are kids who want to study agriculture, many of them who come from a rural background, and once they get into Georgia, University of Georgia, whether it's Tifton, Griffin, or Athens, they do exceptionally well, and we are we, are, we feel privileged to have such a great student body. A couple other things I want to mention at our campus in Tifton. Uh, we do have new senior leadership. Again, this is the individual who replaced David Bridges, Dr. Joe West. He's been on that campus for quite a few years. He is a dairy scientist. We have several new majors in Tifton as well. And we're growing our faculty numbers. Uh, thanks to many of you in here and your uh, influence on the budgetary process, uh, new positions have been added to the College of Agriculture, and frankly, a lot of those new positions have been put in Griffin because they are focused on a lot of the traditional agricultural crops, and uh, Tifton is the right place for those positions. Uh, Griffin is undergoing a tremendous um, change right now, and it's because the University of Georgia is now bringing other campus programs to the Griffin campus. Uh, the Agriculture College has been there for the last 150 years, first as a research institution, then in uh, we brought extension to Griffin, and then more recently, the last four or five years, we've had some uh, college teaching programs there. But now the University of Georgia is bringing some other programs there, family consumer sciences, uh, biology, the Terry School of Business are teaching degrees at the Griffin campus. So it's been a significant change at that campus and is really changing the way that we are thinking about the future of that organism or, or, um, uh, uh, organization. Uh, the student population is expanding, and we expect it to grow exponentially over the next couple of years, especially in colleges other than agriculture. We're going to continue to grow, but uh, relatively slowly and deliberately. Uh, but we believe the other colleges, uh, again, education, business, will grow uh, much more quickly, and it's creating a fairly interesting dynamic on that campus. A couple things I want to talk about for issues that have uh, you've played a major role in the past. Again, I want to thank you for all your support 
of the College of Agriculture. We are a top college of ag. Uh, yes, we did go through some very difficult budget times around 2000, 2001, but we are growing back out of that. And we are not that far from being able to meet all of our statutory obligation to, uh, obligations to the citizens of the state of Georgia. You provided money in the past for maintenance and operations, some new positions in construction. Uh, the maintenance and operation, as all of you know, is a significant issue for both the experiment station and our extension programs. Uh, we are historically underfunded. There was a 1997 uh, summer legislative study that documented the needs of the college just to get back up to where it needed to be. And uh, uh, working with uh, the governor and the House and Senate Ag Committees, you have been growing our budgets to allow us to meet our needs around the state. Now, we manage about 17,000 acres of land around the state. We have about 835 buildings that we're responsible for. We actually have more buildings in the experiment station than the entire University of Georgia campus has in Athens. So that's a lot of infrastructure to manage, and that's really the, the essence of our needs for maintenance and operation. You've added some new positions. We are currently searching for those positions as we speak, and some of the construction is currently underway, and I want to show you a couple of those projects. Last year, as you know, we, we had some interesting times related to funding of the dining hall at our Rock Eagle 4-H camp. This is a premier 4-H camp anywhere in the country. Uh, but by the end of the session, the problem had been solved. We are now able to build the full scope of the dining hall. Our programs at Rock Eagle, frankly, are limited right now because we cannot feed enough students all at once. And so we begin feeding students for, at lunch, for example, around 10.30 in the morning. And then we get them out of there around 1.30 in the afternoon. And we have to rotate them in and out because of the small size of the current dining hall. Also, as we bring more adult groups in there to become more self-sustaining uh, in the future, they expect better facilities than what we have right now. But anyway, the problem was solved. We are moving forward with construction. You can see in that picture the metal uh, is going up. We expect it to have it under roof within the next couple, um, uh, two or three months, and from that construction should move very quickly. It will not be ready for this summer's um, camping schedule, but hopefully if everything goes well, we'll be ready by next year for students moving on to the campus. A small amount of money was also provided to our Vidalia Onion Research Station down near Vidalia. Uh, that money was matched by some of the, the grower committees in that region. That building, uh, which is primarily be cons being constructed with prison inmate labor, is going along quite well. And it's the only University of Georgia building I've ever seen that is ahead of schedule in construction. So we, are, we should hopefully have that one open up fairly soon. We will be having a. Um, a, um, a grower's field day later on this spring, and we hope that the building is open and ready to be de dedicated by that time. And we're going to be cutting that one awfully close, but it's moving along quite well right now. Uh, just so you know what the governor did provide in, into his FY09 budget for maintenance and operations on the research side, $700,000. Uh, <clears> on the research side as well, a food security microbiologist. This is primarily in the poultry industry, $125,000. On the extension side, once again, maintenance and operations, $300,000. Uh, the governor also recommended funding for six agents in training. I want to come back to that in just a minute. And then also two positions on the extension side for specialists, one for the green industry and one for the peanut industry to work on some um, new and emerging insect pests that we have in each of these industries. But I do want to go back to the agents in training. This is a critical issue for the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences. Within the next five years, we are going to be losing more than 50 percent of all of our extension agents throughout the state. Now, what happened was in right after World War II, we hired that first generation or block of extension agents coming back from the war. They retired as a block. For the most part, we then hired the baby boomer generation. They are now retiring as a block. And so that's why they will be leaving here very shortly. They're on federal retirement, so it makes, makes no sense for them to stay around beyond their 30 years of service to the university. We will also have individuals leaving for various other reasons, family or professional reasons. And because of that, we're going to lose more than half of our agents. This is a crisis in the extension program right now. We are doing a lot of things to try to get ready for that. We are trying to promote uh, the service of um, students into these programs. We're providing internships to help to encourage them to think about careers in extension. We're looking at salaries. Uh, we're looking at recruiting out of other states. Uh, Auburn, uh, University of Florida are having some budgetary problems right now, and that may be a, a right picking ground for us 
to find individuals to take over some of these programs in the future. Uh, but one of the things we do need is we know that if we take someone right out of school, either with a BS or MS degree, and put them off into a, a large ag county, it's a very, very difficult position. As many of you know, extension agents can often be the lifeblood of any of communities, especially some of the uh, well, southwest Georgia uh, counties especially. Uh, they are very important positions with a tremendous amount of responsibility. Someone right out of school has a, has a lot of difficulty integrating themselves into that position. So what we have proposed to hire agents in training where they would move off into a county with a successful ag agent or, or 4-H agent, work there for a year or two, learn what it's like to be a good ag extension agent, and then move them off into their own county after they've gotten the, kind of the, the, um, the way the system works. And uh, We asked for 12 agents in training. The governor was kind enough to provide us for uh, six, uh, assuming that uh, our budgets do allow. We, uh, we hope to go back to him next year and ask for the additional six agents in training. So the governor is very good to us. Uh, we hope that you will continue to support the budget. Uh, we had additional positions that were in our, our list of needed positions for various commodities around the state. Um, I don't take a position on any of those, but I know that some of you have had an interest in a few of them. The one I hear the most about is a position, an oil seeds agronomist position to work on soybeans and uh, help that industry move into the biofuels industry. Uh, but anyway, any help you can uh, provide to us in supporting the governor's request and in d with additional positions will be greatly appreciated. Just two other things I do want to mention since a couple of you on the committee have asked me about this in the last couple of weeks. Uh, our Midville facility, as you know, we had mothballed that facility. This is over in the eastern part of the state. Um, it had been mothballed for financial reasons. We have committed ourselves to reopening that station, uh, which we are doing as we speak. We fired a superintendent for the meeting. We've got some other staff there. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful facility for that part of the state. And I know that community is very excited and, and appreciative of what we have been able to do. When we first got into this, I talked about some of our needs to support infrastructure around the state. Again, we have 835 buildings that I wanted to sell off a, a, a third of the entire farm and then use the funds from that sale to build up the rest of the Midville facility. And we were moving along uh, well with that. Uh, but over the last uh, probably six months or so, an idea has been floated in Washington, D.C. to provide some federal funding to that farm to work on a number of different areas, grain crops, but also energy issues. And so we are waiting to see what will happen at the federal level. If that funding comes through, we will need that extra land, the one-third of land on that farm for new programs using the federal funding, and so we will not go through with the sale. If we do not get the federal funding, then we will need the funds from that sale to help rebuild the rest of the farm. We have an awful lot of equipment to buy for that farm, as you can might imagine. Uh, so the farm will be open. We'll be having a, a, a grand opening and a field day this summer. We would invite any of you who are from that region to come visit us, but it, it is a very exciting event for that part of the state. And the last thing I just want to very briefly mention is a USDA facility agricultural research service in Watkinsville, a thousand acres of land off of Hog Mountain Road just south of the University of Georgia. The president's budget has proposed, has eliminated funding to keep that facility open. Uh, we are encouraging the president and members of Congress and the Senate to find a way to keep that facility uh, viable. We have a great relationship with the USDA, a lot of cooperative work especially related to uh, both beef cattle production and environmental quality. Uh, it would be a problem for our programs if that facility were to close down, and that's why we're encouraging the federal government to retain that facility. But if it were to close, and it's, it's obviously not our decision, but if it were to close, we would hope that that facility could be transferred over to the College of Agriculture so that we could maintain agricultural research teaching and outreach programs at that facility very much like what it is today. And so I think it would be good for the county. It would be certainly good for the college and the university, but most importantly, uh, good for agriculture in the state of Georgia. So I just want to finish up by thanking the committee for all that you have done. I've gotten to know many of you very well. You've been very supportive of the college. Um, uh, so both on behalf of the college, behalf of the university, and myself in particular, I do want to thank all of you for all that you've done. And, uh, just finish up with one final comment. We are here to help you. Uh, we are servants of the state just like you are, and our job is to help keep agriculture growing in Georgia, to keep it profitable, and to make this the best profession it can be for those who farm the land and for those who process the foods to get it to our table. 
So anything that we can do to help you be successful and help you support agriculture, please don't ever hesitate to call us. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Angle. I'm, uh, I'm glad you all could work it where you could come today with the agri leaders here because they are the people that can help you all reach some of these goals now and in the future. And I'm also glad we've got a lot of green industry people, consumers and producers, that uh, I'm glad can see that you've got a green industry person in the, in the budget. And I'm sure you or some of the crowd on the back, of, if anybody's got any questions or discussions, will hang around. Has anybody on the committee got any questions for Dr. Angle? Ellis? Uh, Dean, you mentioned the USDA facility at uh, Watkinsville. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have any information on the amount of land that the College of Agriculture has had that has been transferred over to other departments of the university and how much over the past period of time? Um, I'm going to turn to some of my colleagues. I know it's probably been, you know, close to 100 or 200 acres on the south end of town going down South Millage, but do any of you have an answer of what's happened over the past decade or so? The, uh, the actual land at, at the lot by the top, we sold some land, transferred some land to technical school up at Cal Utah, uh, but the, the university paid for all the property and owned it on North Avenue. I don't have the exact acreage, but it's probably 200 acres. That was my next question. Is uh, do you have any figures as to how much land that uh, the university is looking at uh, converting to other uses? The, uh, well, basically, we've been told with Millage, with Millage Avenue, familiar with it. Uh, you've got the women's baseball facility on one end, and we've got our arena on the other end as we, as we head out, out of town. The whole side of that road will be taken up by the university. Now we live in the greenhouse going up. That's the place, the greenhouse that is being displaced by the new pharmacy building. That will be one of hopefully a number of greenhouses that will be moved from central campus, our, our greenhouses, botany, genetics. Basically, every greenhouse that's on the main campus will be moved out to the middle. Yeah, so we have, a, of course, the MBAP facility at National Bioag Security Facility that we're in town fishing for will be on that property. And they have some plans for other industrial development on that property. So ultimately, it, it appears that what we may end up with on Millage is the arena and hopefully some surrounding acres we could support for. Now we, we do support the NBAP facility. This is a National Ag Biodefense Facility. It's a half billion dollar uh, organization that could be brought to the Athens. I personally think it would be wonderful for the community. It is a safe facility. Uh, it would be put on College of Agriculture land. We have agreed that if it is if it were to come to Georgia, that we'd be giving up between 30 and 40 acres of land uh, along the Oconee River to help uh, allow them to construct that building. Uh, but I think it's such an important facility for this state and would bring so much economic development in terms of new vaccine development companies and others that would work on animal health. We could really become the, the center of the universe for animal health in Athens uh, with that facility in Athens. So while, yes, we are giving up a little bit, I think the, the benefits of that facility far outweigh anything else we could uh, potentially lose. I just want to strongly encourage you to professor to follow through on closing that facility with, with you mount a, a massive effort to get that property. Uh, because I, I, I've i seen what has happened piecemeal, and, and we all know that it's going to continue. And, and uh, I think it's very important that, that if that facility did, is closed that we get that facility for college bag. Yes, sir, and that would certainly solve many of these problems that we're talking about. Let me take a couple of quick questions more, and uh, we got a group of people out there that have set through this to uh, talk about an invasive plant deal. Uh, Terry? Dean, I, I don't have a question. Just wanted to thank you for and your staff for the, the hospitality y'all showed the Rural Caucus when we met there back last fall and and for showing us around for a couple of days there and also uh dr joe broder worked with us try to get us an intern for the rural caucus and it, all that kind of fell through despite as hard as everybody tried but hopefully we can start again and and make that happen this coming year but thank y'all for all you do well thank you and i enjoyed working with you i uh, will continue to try to work on the internship i think it's a great idea 
for your staff. Uh, we also want to thank the entire committee for your financial support and the donation that you made to the college uh, last year. That's going to help students uh, study agriculture, which I think is something that we are all very much interested in. Lemo? I, too, Dean, would like to thank you for all you do for agriculture in this state. You know, I'm a farmer myself. You mentioned tomatoes and the research for alternative fuel for tomatoes. Do we have the capacity in the state of Georgia to utilize this technology if we develop it? Uh, well, the technology does not exist at this point. Uh, what we would like to be able to do to take vegetable, fruit, fruit and vegetable waste, ferment them much like we would do corn to produce ethanol and use that ethanol on the farm for energy purposes. Uh, so there are there's certainly a lot of good ideas and there's a lot of prototype technologies, but none of them have been adapted for use on vegetable, vegetable or fruit farms. So it's really it's a transfer of existing technologies. Yes, I think it's certainly possible to use, uh, to adapt existing technologies to, um, to a vegetable farm in South Georgia and certainly supplement some of the current energy that they're after having to purchase off farm. Thank you. Tom? Uh, very briefly, I just wanted to uh, thank you for your uh, support for our fruit and vegetable facility there in Bacon County, Alma. Your folks have been uh, very supportive of that and uh, helping it get established and we appreciate not only there but throughout the state where you try to diversify and put some of these facilities down where the crops really are being grown. I think that's very positive for Georgia and I just want to say thank you. Well, I appreciate that. We, we certainly understand our role in the state and work hard to make sure that we want to continue to grow the industry. Uh, I, I guess personally I want to say it's been a real pleasure working with the blueberry industry. Uh, that's, that's a fun group of people. It's a growing industry. I think some, there, there's a lot of excitement in that industry right now about where it can be five or ten years from now. I, I suspect we'll be one of the largest blueberry producers anywhere in the world. Dean, I want to make one statement and then i got a quick question and then we've got to get to this other. On the first, uh, first couple of slides you showed was uh, basically said y'all were the research and development for agriculture in Georgia. And I agree with that and I think you'll agree what I'm fixing to say is that, that my concern is you can do all the research and development you want to but if it doesn't get to the end user which is basically farmers or the greenhouse industry or whoever the end user is, then it's not much good. And the way that it gets there is through agents. And this agent in training is an important thing that all of us need to understand how important it is because, as you said, the guy that's a little older than me is fixing to retire and go fishing. And we really need to keep on top of getting – new hires, whether they're young or fresh out of college or middle age or whatever, in the system to be able to get y'all's R&D to us. That's the, the land-grant model. I appreciate you articulating that for us. To, uh, to that end, um, you know, half the population in this state lives in 16 counties that we sit in kind of in the middle of. I think Representative Levitas' farm is right in the middle of, of that 16 <laughs> counties. And, you know, being a product of 4-H, as I am, uh, there's a lot of kids in this part of the state that could eventually maybe turn into an agent or at least give them something to do that doesn't necessarily have to be agriculture. It may keep them off the street and us not keeping them up when they're behind bars. Are y'all working more toward the urban type? children in schools? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we're closing in on 50% of all of the young people in 4-H now being from a urban or suburban environment. So it's very different from the way it was 50 years ago. Uh, we understand that we are here to serve all the citizens of the state. And while agriculture is located, obviously, in the more rural parts of the state, at least of more traditional ag industries, we know that the population is located in especially the Atlanta metro area. And so uh, we've been building our programs in that area very quickly, and that's what has led to the fact that uh, almost half of our students in 4-H now come from an urban or suburban background. 
Uh, it's required us to have different types of programs. Uh, it's not as not nearly as easy to uh, uh, show large animals, but we have adapted our our programs to meet the the needs of those communities. And I hear just as much good work and see just as much good work coming out of our urban programs in 4-H as I do in the rural parts of the state. And uh, I, um, you know, we understand that the rural part or the urban part of the state will continue to grow and so we have committed ourselves to focusing on uh, that part through 4-H but we're also committed to focusing more of our tr some of our traditional programs in the more um, urban part of the state. Urban agriculture for example, the green industry uh, the turf grass industries, all those that have a strong urban connection, uh, we are growing as well through our urban, through the Urban Ag Council and new hires, many of which the, you have supported and promoted over the last couple of years. Um, our, those programs are can, can continue to grow because we have to remain relevant to all the citizens of the state. Well, I'm glad you woke up and. and you know, up, uh, up until, uh, you know, the green industry and the urban ag was the fastest growing side of ag until a little thing called level four hit. And uh, so we, uh, I, that's just some of the concern we have is, is keeping Kevin happy and, and uh, you know, possibly picking up some urban kids to come tell me how to grow cows. <laughs> That's still a possibility. <laughs> but thank you very much. And again, I appreciate you working y'all schedule what agri leaders people could hear what you had to say about the college that all of us pay for. Yeah. You do doing we appreciate your time and invitation today. Thank, thank you. you, sir. All right, one more little deal we gotta handle is uh Representative Stuckey, Benefield, Stuckey, Benefield, Stuckey, Benefield, Stephanie. Uh, and I'm sure there's some going to be some follow-up speakers mm -hmm. on both sides of, of, of your your presentation, uh, and we all understand that this is a hearing only because it needs some tinkering and Stephanie needs some understands work. that. <laughs> Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I will be brief in my introductory remarks. But let me preface by saying that as a lawyer, I am out of my element in front of this esteemed committee and in front of the agriculture leaders and the University of Georgia. I'm an alumnus, but of the law school, and I was a French major, so I am a little out of my element here. My district, like Farmer Levitas, is in the metro DeKalb area, city of Decatur, sort of the heart of my district. Uh, so I'm very honored to be in front of this committee and. Your, the expertise in this room is um, overwhelming on this issue. Uh, I am here uh, on House Resolution 887, which seeks to address the problem of invasive species in our state. The reason I got involved with this is I have a constituent, and like Chairman McCall, I read all those emails that come to us, and she emailed me uh, with a concern. She had gone to a local uh, a nursery. I won't give their name, but it's a large a chain and she bought several plants and was surprised when she went home and she got on the internet to do a little research about the plants and she learned that they were on the National Park Service list of alien invaders. Uh, I had no idea what alien plants were and I did a little research and um, of course I knew about kudzu but I was surprised to learn things such as English ivy that, and bamboo which I have in my own yard are, are also invasive species. Uh, I also learned that invasive species not only are destructive to our environment and our ecosystem, but they're also devastating to our economy. Uh, some $137 billion are spent in our country annually on uh, eradicating and controlling invasive species. So that's just uh, an example of how expensive uh, to our economy invasive species can be. Uh, so I introduced this resolution uh, somewhat naively uh, and just said we ought to look at the, the list from the National Park Service and use that as a guide. Uh, I have since been contacted by Connie Gray, who's here today, and I'm going to hand this presentation over to her. She's president of the Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Council, and I had a, a very productive meeting with her, and she brought in some of the folks from the green industry who are here today as well uh, to, talk to talk to me about their concerns. I learned that the list that I had referred it to, and my resolution is not the best list. It's not Georgia-specific. There are some plants on that list that are not invasive to Georgia, 
And there are other plants that are omit, omitted from the list that are invasive. I've also learned there's categories. Some plants are more invasive than others. Uh, so it's a very complex issue. Uh, and I certainly uh, understand some of the things I call for is outright ban. Uh, that, that got a bit of interest from the green industry. I understand that may be going a little too far. Uh, I think what needs to happen, what I hope this committee will consider, is uh, we need to look at this issue. It's clearly a problem. You're all aware of it much more so than I am. Uh, I think education is key. That's what many of the good folks in this room are already working on. Uh, but I think we need to do more. Um, I certainly would like to see uh, what, what my constituent recommend is there be some sort of uh, label or, or warning uh, or something on these plants that are invasive when they're sold uh, at nurseries uh, just so that the consumer is aware of the potential impact. Uh, so I think there's a lot that needs to be done with education. I'm hoping, uh, I, I trust this is issue to the, to the guidance and the wisdom of this committee, but I hope you'll look at perhaps maybe doing a study committee, if not, not a formal study committee with the House, uh, perhaps a, an informal within the breast of this committee uh, to look at this issue of the interim. Uh, I'd be honored to work with you all on that as, as a metro area farmer. Uh, but I think it's an important issue, and I just invite your feedback on how we can best address this. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Connie Gray, who I've already mentioned is president of the Georgia Exotic Pet Plant, Pest Plant Council. And she has some folks here to speak as well, and I'm going to let her introduce them. I'm happy to entertain questions, but there are people who know a lot more about this issue than I do. So you might want to reserve your questions for the real experts. Thank you, Stephanie. If it's any consolation since 1995, I have never been in front of a Judiciary Committee either, so I'm scared to get in front of all of lawyers. It's taken me 10 years to come in front of y'all. <laughs> we, uh, we are probably going to have uh, comments on both sides, and normally we put out a sign-up sheet and we didn't, so however y'all want to work this, it, I do want you to say who you are and who you represent when you, when you stand up and talk. And, We've been here a long time, so try to keep them. Okay. As well, short I'm going to let Miss Gray start. I know the garden clubs are here. I know people from the green industry are here, and whoever else and, wants and to come. And you're welcome to hang around and wrap up at the end, whatever you want to do. Absolutely. That, really. Okay. Well, depending on time. Okay. Thank you. I have some materials for you. Thank you. My name is Connie Gray, and I'm here on behalf of the Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Council, which I will call Georgia EPSI for short because it is hard to spit out. Uh, we are a nonprofit founded in 1999 that provides a network for addressing the invasive exotic pest plant problem on several levels. Our organization is primarily concerned with those invasive plants that negatively impact natural areas. We are a state chapter of a Southeast Exotic Pest Plant Council and also a member of a national Exotic Pest Plant Council. Our board of directors includes representatives from the Georgia Forestry Commission, the University of Georgia, U.S. Forest Service, Georgia DNR, the Nature Conservancy, Zoo Atlanta, other environmental nonprofits, and the Georgia Green Industry Association. So we represent a very wide range of professions, interests, and expertise. We provide a variety of educational pro programs, contribute to educational material that's written both in print and on the web, and have developed a thorough ranked list of invasive plants specific to Georgia, which is that brochure that I've handed to you. This is currently the most comprehensive and up-to-date Georgia-specific list in existence. Georgia EPSI applauds Representative Benfield's efforts in preparing this resolution. It is extremely important that state lawmakers become familiar with this critical environmental issue. Since the Invasive Species Federal Executive Order number 13112 was signed in 1999, interest in the legislation for invasive species has increased and a number of new laws have been enacted nationwide in several regions. We hope that this discussion today will ultimately result in progress in Georgia. We do not, however, support this resolution in its present form, primarily for the reasons that Stephanie's already mentioned. When we learned of this issue, we, we immediately uh, contacted Representative Benfield and had, as she said, it was a very productive um, meeting, and she was very receptive to the, the ideas and the thoughts that we had, and I think was pleased to know that there were a bunch of people already thinking about this issue. Uh, my specific concerns, to just reiterate what Representative Benfield has already said, the list um, is inadequate for uh, the needs of the state of Georgia, and that there is a list, at least as a starting point, it's not a perfect list, but it is a very uh, well thought out one and put together 
by a number of, uh, of highly trained professionals. A um, number of the species that are on the list that was referenced by the resolution also are not commercially grown or sold, so they really do not belong in the resolution of this type. Secondly, at this time, we do not feel that a resolution prohibiting the sale and use of plants that are economically important to any industry in the state is the way we need to start out by addressing, to address this issue. The largest number of individual plant species on our list there that are considered to be invasive and, cons and are con continue to be grown and sold are ornamental plants, that is, the green industry plants used in landscapes and gardens, although these species vary quite widely in economic value. We have worked closely with the Georgia, the Georgia Green Industry Association for several years through a task force, and they'll be talking a little bit more about that. And we've collaborated with them to provide education to their membership as well as to the general public. And with them have developed a list of alternative plant species for some of the most problematic um, plants. We've been very gratified with the industry's willingness to be proactive in this issue. And Georgia FC believes that working cooperatively with the green industry is the most beneficial and productive way to begin eliminating invasive species from the nursery trade. Thirdly, regulation of the type proposed is expensive and labor intensive and currently not practical for our state agriculture department to implement. And we believe the funds could be used better towards more critical needs. This resolution only addresses the problem of adding to existing infestations and does nothing to deal with the substantial problems that are already threatening our national, natural biodiversity. We would like the committee to consider the following specific recommendations. We need support for data collection, specifically mapping current infestations of invasive plants and tracking their spread. There is a web-based program that the Southeast Exotic Pest Plant Council has that you can access on their web where anybody can um, identify, locate um, invasive plants on there. But so far, the data collection has been very limited since it relies on voluntary participation, and there is no incentive or structure guiding this input. We need a coordinated effort to cover the entire state in order to assemble accurate data. This information is essential to confirming and modifying any state invasive plant list and would greatly reduce any controversy regarding such a list. Second, there is great need for support for research. We need to better understand how these invasive plants degrade natural areas, their biology and mechanisms for spreading, and we need improved ways to manage them in ways that minimize the negative impacts on and enhance the restoration of natural ecosystems. There are many research projects going on right now, but we need much more. Thirdly, um, we need alternative species for soil stabilization and erosion control. While ornamental plants represent the greatest number of species on the list, as I mentioned before, uh, plantings for soil stabilization represent the largest quantity of plants and the lar largest acreage of intentionally planted invasive species. Four commonly used species are ranked as category one or two, the highest rankings on our list. Since preventing erosion is also a very critical environmental issue, it is essential that a coordinated effort be made that considers both needs. We at Georgia EPSI strongly recommend that this research focus on native alternative species because of a number of other environmental benefits. Fourth, we need support for a mechanism for early detection and rapid response. This will provide a way to identify and aggressively manage new infestations before they become widespread. It is far more cost effective to prevent new problems than to tackle an existing one. We continue to find new invasive plants in Georgia that are known to be seriously invasive elsewhere such as garlic mustard found at Kennesaw Mountain, Kogon grass throughout the south, southern part of the state, and oriental bittersweet, which we're finding more and more throughout the metro area. Immediate action is needed to keep these plants from spreading. Fifth, we desperately need support for management and control efforts for land managers, including local governments. The state has provided incentives and funding to acquire new green space, but no provisions were made for the management and restoration of natural ecosystems in these areas. And this happens to be something I'm intimately familiar with, having worked for DeKalb County and also working with the city of Atlanta. And I know that financial resources available for invasive plant control are extremely limited. Sixth, um, we feel at Georgia FC that, that regulation of new plant introductions is needed. I don't know that GGIA um, agrees with me on this, but I do not see that a voluntary testing program is adequate. Currently, plant collectors can bring practically any plant from other countries in, propagate them, and offer them for sale. 
the risk that even one new introduction be can become a new invasive plant is too many. Seventh, we need a state policy and official state list to provide guidance to all affected agencies so that we're all on the same page. There is a state invasive management plan in progress uh, led by the Georgia DNR, and that should be ready sometime later on this year. This will address invasive species of all types of organisms, not just plants. We have been involved in this process, and we expect to support the final outcome. Eighth, um, considering a state noxious weed law is something that we would support that would empower our agriculture department to reduce the spread of many weeds, but this was not the same as the as, um, HR 887, and usually um, a state noxious weed list doesn't have many, if any, um, commercially important plant, plants as far as sold commercially. And last, my last point I'd like to make is that we feel the green industry must make progress eliminating invasive plants from the trade within a reasonable time frame. If this no, does not happen, then I think we need to look at this resolution again. Um, however, I feel very confident, having worked with these people, that you will see some progress very soon. We would also like to request to be involved in any further s discussions on this issue. We do bring a lot of expertise to the table, and um, we would like to very much to, to be a part of that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. As time rolls on, I'm sure you'll hear from us. I didn't know all these invasive plants in the yard were on a, on a list. Skeeter? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, committee members. For sake of time, I'm going to be pretty brief. I'm Skeeter McCorkle. President of McCorkle Nurseries in Deering, Georgia. McDuffie County gets mentioned twice in your meeting this morning. We're a 65-year-old family business, a 500-acre plant farm there, and, and with me and prepared to speak this morning, but for sake of time, we're going to make this a little more cryptic. I want to introduce uh, some, some of my colleagues. Sherry Loudermilk is Executive Director of the Georgia Green Industry Association for the past 21 years. Mr. Rick Barnes, Vice President of Naturescapes, a major landscape uh, company here in Metro Atlanta, former chairman of Georgia Green Industry Association, and also current chairman of the Invasive Plant Task Force that Connie mentioned uh, just briefly ago. And finally, Mike Sykes. Uh, Mike Sykes is, we call him the plant guru. He probably possesses more plant knowledge than uh, than in his little finger than I have in my whole head, but he, he certainly knows the subject and has been involved with this task force uh, since it was formed some time ago. Just one statement on the green industry, uh, and Terry, you'll appreciate this. This is pre-drought numbers, uh, 8.2 billion annual impact of the green industry, 79,000 Georgians employed. We know that's a little different now. Uh, with stage four, and we certainly appreciate the, the work and the help you're trying to, to, to do for us in, in that regard. And with all respect to uh, Representative Benfield, uh, we cannot support H.R. 877, uh, and I believe we are not alone with all of uh, those that I have talked to in the horticultural and agricultural community throughout the state. And it's not that the issue of invasive plants is not important. It certainly is. Our industry has been working on this issue since 2002, almost six years. We created a task force of experts on this subject. Uh, many are represented in this room today, certainly the University of Georgia, uh, Extension, uh, the Hort Department, Georgia Department of Ag here in the back. Uh, it's with us, DNR, Parks and Recreation. Georgia EPSI, as we uh, stated earlier, uh, the state botanical gardens were represented, certainly uh, plant sellers and plant producers, so a very broad-based task force to look uh, holistically at this issue and to begin the work and to begin the education on, on this important issue. We, we handed to you uh, several things that, that have been already developed. Uh, this, this list kind of outlines some of that work that's gone on over this past uh, history, and I won't go back into, into details uh, on, on that at this point. I will tell you that we have major problems with the list, uh, and, and I think uh, Representative Benfield has certainly spoken to that already. 
we uh, we differ a little bit from uh, Connie's remarks uh, in, in the uh, exotic plants, and that's plants that are not native in the technical sense to the state of Georgia uh, or from other countries around the world. Roughly 80% of the plants sold in our industry are considered exotic by, by those definitions, and we're, we're talking about by and far the minority of, of offenders. We're talking, you know, less than, than 1%. And of those main offenders, if you see the level one offenders, uh, our industry has voluntarily begun to move away from those plants. My nursery case in point uh, dropped anything that's in, in level one, and that's also already ongoing and will continue. Uh, the list that we hand you is a work in progress, and uh, it, first of all, uses sound science and a collaborative approach with the task force that I mentioned to you uh, to create this list. And our goal, quite simply, is to have a holistic single list that is sound science-based, that is Georgia-based, and is good for all of Georgians and to get the buy-in of all the major plant stakeholders uh, that would be impacted with this list. Currently, this list is being reviewed uh, by a number of organizations. And for sake of time, Mr. Chairman, I'll, uh, I'll stop my comments at, at that point. Uh, we do have a copy of a very extensive report, if you'd like to have, don't have enough for everyone, but produced uh, earlier. Uh, and all the research has been done in, uh, nationally and across uh, other states on this issue. Very important issue to our industry and uh, one we, we take very seriously, but we certainly have a very different approach to solving this, and we believe we have a solution uh, in, in reach as we work uh, for that. We've got the experts here a little later. If you want to ask us any questions, we'll be... Uh, Glad to entertain those. Thank you. Thank you, Skeeter. Not to kill any more trees, but could you give Amanda a copy of that report you just talked about and she can get it to us at a later time? All right, real quickly, is anybody else? We're running short on getting over yonder and mashing the button, so to speak, it don't fuss at us. Uh, Taz? Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Uh, my name's Taz Smith, uh, Georgia Farm Bureau. Just wanted to thank Representative Benefield for bringing this issue to, to the forefront. Uh, we agree that there are some invasive species in the state, the kudzu and things like that, but we do have concerns as far as the National Park Service list. Um, one of the items on that list is Kentucky 31 tall fescue, which is you know, a major part of the state's economy, especially up in North Georgia. It's bailed all over the North Georgia area. Um, one of the items on the list also is Japanese maple, uh, which is in, in yards all across this state. So we just wanted to express those concerns as far as those specific type issues and those specific type plants and things like that. Um, but we just want this to be worked out. Uh, we're, we, we're opposed to building the current form, but just want to bring those concerns to y'all's uh, items there. Thank you. Thank you, Taya. Mr. Chairman. Real quick. Gary Black, George Agribusiness Council. When, when I first look at the list, and uh, as cattle producers, we made a little different perspective from the uh, from the green industry because there's certainly a, my colleagues from the green industry have made some excellent points this morning. We looked at the list, and, and uh, 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 dog fennel's on this list, and Canadian thistle. And I said, I don't know, I'm, maybe I can be for this list, but also tall fescues on this list too. And control of those first two species, it's going to cost me two thousand dollars, as it will you. Mr. Chairman, but there are others. Main thing I want to point out: the list is an issue, but it's it's not an issue of working with the author of the bill. And we'd love to be a part of those discussions and offer our support to the chairman if it comes through a study committee or other things to try to uh, address these and get a get the proper list that's uh, that's good for Georgia. But thank you for the opportunity. Just a quick comment. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Stephanie. You want to kind of follow up, please, ma'am. Thank you. I, I just want to reiterate, like I said at the beginning, I, I too am opposed to my own resolution in its current form. Uh, 
I recognize that there are many issues that are valid. I like fescue as well uh, with, the, with the list, but it's a starting point for a good discussion. I know this has been an abbreviated discussion, but uh, I think it's an important issue, and I'm happy to work with you on revising this resolution, perhaps to have it call for a study committee. Uh, but I'm going to seek guidance from you, Mr. Chairman, and the members of the committee about the best way to proceed. But I know we de do need to get an agreed upon list, and I know there are categories of invasiveness. So it, the, you know, working out the list may be somewhat complex. And then we need to discuss what's the appropriate response. And I found the green industry um, survey very informative. It was interesting how many of the the folks act, you know, in the green industry want to be proactive on this, want to educate the public, inform the public of the invasive nature of some of the species offered. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here to work with the green industry uh, in coming up with some appropriate responses. Thank you, Stephanie, for bringing this to us. Uh, a lot of folks may have realized, but a lot of folks didn't realize how uh, dangerous some of this is. Uh, the two weeds that Gary was talking about are awful. And, uh, you know, it, it costs a fortune to control them. So that's the kind of stuff we need to work on. And thank you for understanding and being willing to work that this list ain't the list we need to go by. Uh, thank you all all for coming today and sitting through this. Most ag meetings don't last this long. We try not to let them last this long. But today was a abnormal, uh, informative meeting. Agri leaders, hope you all learned something. Go across the street and tell us what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, to the plant people, thank you all for coming. And uh, Dean, thank you very much. And I'm sure you all all will be working together with Stephanie, too, on some of this stuff if we get to that far. But thank you very much. Meeting adjourned.